invest in ourselves. We all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, I'm Greg Carr, your host. And this week, we will continue in our ongoing dialogue aimed at building community, aimed at helping us better understand the issues that face us in contemporary society and connecting scholarship, connecting thinking work to problem solving as we work collectively. Uh, Today, I'm very excited. We're going to have a conversation that really talks about how extreme wealth influences public policy, social policy, and more specifically, how the history of philanthropy in tandem with government Mm -hmm. over the arc of the last century or so have shaped the way that white supremacy, white nationalism, or white internationalism has maintained itself, often with the help of academics and scholars. All of this, of course, we're, we're doing uh, to examine how to dismantle those systems and create something better, something new, something that will help us in our common humanity. So we're going to ask some questions today. Uh, how scholars contributed to these oppressive, uh, oppressive systems? How has philanthropy and extreme wealth recruited scholars to help uh, them maintain these systems of oppression? And we're going to do all that and more with uh, Dr. Maribel Mori who is the director of the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences. Um, She has written a remarkable new book, White Philanthropy. And if you don't have it, you should go get it immediately. White Philanthropy, Carnegie Corporation's An American Dilemma and the Making of a White World Order. Um, She uh, has a PhD from Princeton, a JD from New York University School of Law, started out at Notre Dame and uh, a lot of other academic credentials. Uh, She was, uh, before she started the Institute, a professor at Clemson University. Uh, She's worked at a number of schools, uh, including overseas, Stockholm, Sweden. Um, But most importantly, she has marshaled her um, considerable gifts and talents to independent institution building. We're going to hear about how her journey has led her to where she is right now. Uh, Professor Maribel Maury, so wonderful to have you here at the table. It's a, it's amazing. Thank you, Dr. Carr, for this invitation. No, Greg, please. Otherwise, I'm going to call you Dr. Maury. And then we just <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, look, one of the beautiful things, y'all, is we dropping all pretension. Yeah, um, no, I like it. You know, well, I mean, you've guided us in that. I mean, so <laughs> we, we, we absolutely want to enter this conversation. I'm going to resist the urge and say at the onset that we want to have you back. Uh, we can't wait to have you back because I was now I'm wondering what you think being a Notre Dame grad. Uh, there's, I don't know if you've seen this new article in the New Yorker about Amy Comey Barrett. I'm like, I'm going to ask her about that. <laughs> but I'm going to resist the urge and, and, and get and get right to the business. This book, White Philanthropy, mm. fills a gap that I think those of us who uh, work in fields like Africana studies, mm-hmm. um, Uh, think about decolonial studies, probably knew needed to be filled. But until reading this book, um, really what you lay out is a roadmap for how we should think about this question of extreme wealth and its relationship to oppression. Could you say a little bit about what led you to write White Philanthropy? Okay. So my interest in American Dilemma goes back to my undergraduate years at Notre Dame. So before I went to NYU and before um, and the Princeton, the PhD. And so back in the day, I was trying to make sense of my full identity as a Latina woman. Um, and so I was very interested in the race sex analogy. I was still separating my identities before I knew about intersectionality, um, which I was more exposed to um, in law school uh, through critical race theory. Um, so at the time, I, and I was studying in Paris and I got, I was exposed to Simone de Beauvoir's work. And I realized that in writing The Second Sex, she had relied on this white Swedes book to tease out the race sex analogy. And I thought that was really interesting for many ways. I, I thought, why would this woman who at the time I thought was, you know, this brilliant scholar need to rely on a man? 
Um, and second, what did this white Swede have to say about race in the US? Um, why was he selected? Um, so as I was getting more and more interested in the academy, I thought I should really study the politics of knowledge in the academy. It was fascinating to me because no matter what I would say, I ultimately was sensing that no matter how brilliant scholarship I would create, my work would be, someone else's work would be cited instead, as specifically a white Anglo-American man or someone with proximity to that identity, such as Gunnar Myrdal as a white Swede. Um, so I really wanted to understand these uh, behind the scenes dynamics because when I went to law school too, um, individuals such as um, Supreme Court Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was at the ACLU, would cite Gunnar Myrdal instead of Simone de Beauvoir to mm -hmm. make that race-sex analogy um, in the 14th Amendment cases. Mm -hmm. So I thought this woman who was obviously imp uh, impacted by Beauvoir is choosing to cite Myrdal instead because she knows her audience. Um, so I, I was already skeptical of the text um, through undergrad and grad uh, and, and law school. And then when I went to uh, Princeton, I was taking a class with uh, Melissa Harris Perry, Dr. Melissa Harris Perry, on African American political thought. And I asked her, I'm like, do you think this would be part of the canon? And knowing basically the answer, she said, <laughs> absolutely not. And I was like, this is fascinating. <laughs> oh. So what does it mean to create knowledge and for whom? Like, who is this knowledge being created for? Um, so that's the beginning of my investigation. And when I figured out or started learning that it was funded by a foundation, that just took another interest for me because again, being Cuban, being raised in this Cold War environment, there were only two political economies that were possible in my psyche. It was either profit maximizing capitalism where you forgave all forms of profit maximizing mm -hmm. or communism. So who were these people, these white Anglo-Americans who were based in New York, who seemed to want to solve social problems, but not enough to be a Che Guevara. They definitely were not Che Guevara. <laughs> so, who are these people? And what does it mean for them to address problems and for whom? And what are they trying to preserve or change? So I, I became very fascinated by um, quote unquote philanthropy. I see. This is this is this this in itself is fascinating. I mean, first of all, to to exhibit the kind of mastery that you uh, display in the book uh, and to realize that this is something that you took up in your undergraduate years, which, which aren't aren't that long ago. It really shows your commitment to mm -hmm. really. And, and of course, uh, for, well, there may be somebody who's watching the table right now who might not know the book, An American Dilemma. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the things that you've talked about and I've seen even when you've been in conversation across the board, uh, getting beyond our Rolodexes. <laughs> I love I love the way you talk about that, looking horizontally and you know exploding this whole notion that knowledge should be privileged for just a select few or, or people mm -hmm. in our networks. If, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second for those who may not be familiar with Gunnar Murdahl's book, uh, to help uh, folk who are now learning for the first time about mm -hmm. the dilemma know what that is. Yeah, so, okay, so it was a book published in 1944. It was completed in 1942. In the late 1930s, Kearney Corporation of New York, uh, and I'm going to put a parenthesis to that, Kearney Corporation of New York is an, a, not, um, a foundation established by Steel Titan Andrew Carnegie in 1911. Um, and it was started to fund projects in the US, ultimately also Canada and the British colonies. And part of their funding, they fund knowledge production was a study. This was commissioned by one of its presidents in the 1920s who wanted a study, a comprehensive study in the social sciences on black Americans. And Greg, I'm sure we'll talk about the purpose of the study ultimately, but the way the project is remembered, published in 1944, is its um, association with Brown v. Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1954 that found state-sanctioned racially segregated public schools to be unconstitutional, to go against the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So from many circles, um, and we'll talk about like the main mainstream white liberal circles in the U.S., it's remembered as this key study of the civil rights movement. And why? Because in this book, Gunnar Myrdal said, I am presenting you readers, and he really meant white readers, with a long list of anti-black discriminatory policies and behaviors that you white readers commit um, repeatedly, um, whether it's in institutions or you know personal behavior. And it is a tension for you white reader to see that you do this because you have this moral compass. And this is what it's called, um, 
the moral dilemma. An American dilemma is a moral dilemma in the psyche of white Americans because he writes without any um, quantitative data on this. Actually, his researchers would argue against that. Uh, but it was wartime propaganda the, that he was presenting during the Second World War in support of white Americans saying you actually feel really guilty and bad about this. And therefore, when I show you this, these behaviors and policies, you're going to want to change it because you're also rational human beings. So unlike Germans and their mistreatment and genocide of Jews, you actually want to be better in your treatment and genocide of black Americans. Mm -hmm. So he provides a long list. Um, and he ultimately says, like I said, that you can, um, uh, you want to rectify this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's usually how it's remembered. Um, well, then th that, that actually is a perfect uh, place for us to take our first break. And when we come back, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> We're going to walk through the book because you introduce a constellation of characters and uh, two things before we take the break. When we come back, um, we're going to have you help us think about how this American dilemma is really part of a global dilemma that these folk are trying to collude to solve and how these other academics and scholars, uh, folk that you walk in the footsteps of, um, are standing there doing their own insurgent work, but some of them get pulled in, some of them in the periphery. I mean, everyone is in this text. So uh, we're going to take a break. This is our time, our moment to move forward beyond the gun violence, the hospital closures, the unaffordable housing, Brian Kemp's Georgia for the wealthiest few. Stacey Abrams is looking out for every Georgian. She'll invest our $6 billion surplus in the fundamentals, education, healthcare, housing, and a good living. Putting more money in your pocket to build one Georgia where everyone has the freedom to thrive. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are black beyond measure. We've got to stand up. Republicans are banning abortion rights, tearing down democracy, blocking progress. But when Democrats stand together, we win. Because we voted, Democrats stood up for black lives, voting to ban police chokeholds, stood up for black women, putting one on the Supreme Court, stood up for our families, lowering cost of health care and prescriptions and capping insulin, and stood up for millions by slashing student debt. This November, let's stand up together and keep making progress. Welcome back to The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, joined today by uh, Meribel Mori, the founding executive director of the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences. And we're talking about white philanthropy, her recent book, uh, Duke Univers uh, yeah, University of North Carolina Press. I always want to put Duke and North Carolina in the same press, but that's not the case. Uh, and we're talking about the book and we're talking about the implications of her work uh, as it relates to you know our contemporary landscape of academic problem solving. Um, Matter Bell, I, I want to jump right in. As I said before, you've got this astonishing range of characters. And, and as you, uh, you dedicate the book to W.E.B. Du Bois and are very careful as a African an African-American intellectual historian to thread the narrative of these black scholars throughout the text. But having done that, you open chapter one with Andrew Carnegie, mm -hmm. who's at all this money and is gonna influence all of these people up to it, I guess, and including today. Could you talk a little bit about the significance of Carnegie and then uh, cast like Thomas Jesse Jones, who I always like constructed my mind as a villain. I mean, I think, you know, and all these. Could you talk about like these early philanthropists and how they're really they're really hell bent on trying to direct the shape and future of how Black people uh, are mm -hmm. going to move in the world? Mm -hmm. First of all, I love that we can talk about Thomas Jesse Jones for a while, right? <laughs> yes. Carter Woodson was a uh, very big, you know. I have an article coming out explaining how W.B. Du Bois was an early critic of philanthropy. He was so on top of all directions. Um, and Woodson too, specifically in the Encyclopedia Project and also uh, Black Education. And he was on to Thomas Jesse Jones's um, funding patterns um, and impact. 
Okay, so the book, um, an Amer this white philanthropy book, traces the intellectual history of an American dilemma. So in that context, it, it really shows how this president who commissioned the work, um, what he was trying to do with this project in the US and to do that, we go back in time, right, to earlier projects that he financed in British Africa in the 1920s and 30s. That said, um, I didn't want to present it as if this president, Frederick P. Keppel, came in with a blank slate um, in, into an organization with no vision and just plopped in, right? So he, he's working within an in, institutional context. So what is that institutional context? And, and well, Keppel is president of the Carnegie. That's correct. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So Keppel is president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, mm -hmm. founded by Andrew Carnegie in 1911. So, and um, Keppel becomes president in the 1920s and um, leaves in the early 1940s. So, and he soon passes away. So he passes away before an American dilemma is published, actually. Moving back. So what organization did he inherit? What was he coming into? Um, as we know right now with, you know, let's just say in the academy, if we talk about the Harvard letter, right? We know that institutions have their context. So even if you, you have your own model, you know, vision of what you might do in your scholarship, you're coming into an institution that already has patterns of behavior. Yes. So at Carney Corporation, what are those patterns of behavior? So Andrew Carnegie passes um, away in 1919. Um, and he has uh, people on the board that follow his vision. But what is his vision, right? And how is it understood by the people who feel empowered to speak on his behalf. In the foundation world, they call it, right, donor's intent. So how do they express donor's intent in the organization? So James Bertram was his personal secretary who would field uh, letters um, asking him for money, asking Carnegie for money before Andrew Carnegie established Carnegie Corporation, which ultimately moved his private um, philanthropy office into a more institutional setting of board uh, of directors and staff. And he said, you know, he would help the president, Keppel, understand what British colony meant. So Keppel inherits an organization that says in its charter, we fund projects in the US, Canada, and the British colonies. Well, there's a question of what are these geographic spaces? Does the US include the Philippines? Does, um, do the British colonies include, you know, what the, you know, the British government might say is a colony um, from London, or is it something else? And James Bertram enlightens um, Keppel and says what Andrew Carnegie really intended by British colony was communities of whites. There it is. There um, it is. And there's no shame in writing that. So no, I mean, it's just the facts. No question. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes, 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 yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. No, yeah. So in that spirit, he says, and just in case you didn't understand this, uh, Keppel, this means that East Africa is good, Kenya, for example, not West Africa. Huh. South Africa is good, even though it's not officially a colony. And so is New Zealand, Australia, and not officially colonies. Um, so it, you could be a British Dominion, British Commonwealth, but, uh, but not all British colonies would go into this vision of communities of whites. And what he said was, it's not just having white people there. It's a space where white people could dominate. Therefore, for example, India would never receive funding from Carnegie Corporation. Huh. And so this shapes the funding patterns of the organization in the 20s in an informal way. Ultimately, they do... Um, adapt their charter to include British dominions uh, to basically uh, have on paper what they were already doing in practice informally. And one of the, and, 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 and as you so brilliantly lay out, you've got these parallel tracks that end up informing each other and merging. But at the same time, I mean, in some ways, hasn't Carnegie and some of these other philanthropists to these railroad cats cut their eye teeth domestically with like Booker T. Washington? Mm -hmm. they, they start in the 19th century. huh? So while they're expanding and looking at these interests in Africa, what's Carnegie doing domestically that's going to help, you know, help us think through this as, the, as this thing emerges, the American dilemma? Yeah. So Andrew Carnegie himself was very enamored with Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. and he gives a speech in Edinburgh, Scotland um, in the 1910s, in 19, late 1900s late, sorry, 19, oh, the aughts, um, and says, um, this is an educational model that can be used across the British Empire for the other colonized groups, the Tuskegee model. Yeah, so he underscores what Booker T. Washington was accomplishing in Tuskegee and says, this is, if we had only applied this model of education in India earlier, we could have avoided the whole problem. And by problem, um, he means, um, you know, colonized people pushing back and yeah. challenging and re revolutionizing. Yeah. Um, so, and in his vision, uh, so that's one. So Andrew Carnegie was, um, had the vision of expanding 
the Tuskegee educational model internationally as a means of dominating colonized groups, okay? And in a complementary way, his vision of international peace included and underscored Anglo-Saxon unity. Wow. That is truly remarkable. I mean, just given the context, here we are in 2022. I mean, at Howard University, there's a Carnegie Library. I mean, he puts libraries mm -hmm. everywhere. But I think about the fact that Howard trustees added Booker T. Washington in part to get Carnegie's money. Mm -hmm. And Carnegie had almost shied away from that liberal arts type mm -hmm. of model. And to hear you talk about Tuskegee, which, you know, we know Booker T. Washington had his own ideas. I'm probably a little bit more charitable toward Booker T. than some people. But <laughs> my mom from Alabama, so I kind of mm -hmm. see Tuskegee. But but they are plow plowing so much money into shaping the sensibility of these people that they continue to they, they want to continue to oppress mm -hmm. from, from now on. I, I mean, I'm, we're going to take a pause here. But when we come back, uh, Maribel, lead us now into the first third of the 20th century, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. as these plans begin to take shape and they begin to generate these documents, these surveys, mm -hmm. these, these huge, that telephone book that you made me pick out of my library, uh, Lower Haley. I mean, <laughs> when we come back, we're gonna continue this conversation with uh, Meribel Mori uh, on white philanthropy and the implications for today. Back in a moment. We've got to stand up. Republicans are banning abortion rights, tearing down democracy, blocking progress. But when Democrats stand together, we win. Because we voted, Democrats stood up for black lives, voting to ban police chokeholds, stood up for black women, putting one on the Supreme Court, stood up for our families, lowering cost of health care and prescriptions and capping insulin, and stood up for millions by slashing student debt. This November, let's stand up together and keep making progress. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, joined today by Dr. Maribel Mori, the founding executive director of the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences and the author of White Philanthropy, Carnegie Corporations and American Dilemma and the Making of a White World Order. So with that in mind, uh, Prof, when we left, um, you had walked us right up to the edge of the recruiting by the Carnegie Corporation of Gunnar Murdahl, bringing he, him in, he and his his wife, who have done some incredible work in social science, but uh, again, replicating this pattern of asking white folks first, uh, they had approached white scholars domestically to do kind of a national study on black folk. I think you write about Melva Herskovitz, mm -hmm. uh, whose shadow we still live in, apparently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, could you talk about Murdahl, what that study meant, how it involved black scholars, and ultimately, what, what was the purpose of the study and the thrust? Because you also write about a national study, but mm -hmm. policymaking is local and state. And so could you talk a little bit about what they're really up to and after and how Murdoch fits in all this? Okay, I'm going to really try to just bring it all together. Yeah, okay. no, please. Yes, all please. Right. Gotcha. Okay, so um, usually um, scholars have tended to underestimate the vision of Frederick P. Keppel as president of Carney Corporation. Mm. And with that, then... Uh, disconnected the organization's work abroad from its work domestically in the U.S. Um, so what I've done in this research is really just sit, getting bored over a decade in the archives. And I went through Keppel's uncatalogued uh, boxes. Like I, I know about his children, his Christmas cards, blah, blah, blah. You know, I got into his... Can I just note this for everybody? Scholars who work like this, but what you did, when you detailed your research methodology, this took a decade, right? Thousands of pages of work, unprocessed collections. It's truly remarkable as a feat. I just want to say that to you publicly because that's that's no joke. Thank but you. You should have a high tolerance for boredom. <laughs> <laughs> you said I know about his children. I know how that's out of his feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's getting into the psyche. And so I could trace 
his funding patterns and what he was invested in. And so this goes to the purpose of an American dilemma, because in the U.S., we're so programmed in our educational system, you know, from a wee size to associate the national um, level with more progressive policies. Mm -hmm. And obviously to associate this book, An American Dilemma, cited in Brown v. Board of Education as a progressive text. Yes. Uh, though, though scholars such as Derek Bell really pushed back against that in his analysis of uh, Brown v. Board and his experience working for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, right? Yeah. Um, but the mainstream was that the national level, Brown v. Board is all progressive. Um, so understanding Keppel as being invested in this project and coming from this transatlantic um, funding um, interest, I started saying, oh, wait, he talks about black people and white people transnationally. And he has advisors um, in the 1930s, after that study in South Africa, they shift to advisors in London who um, are, are financing and, and planning this African survey with this uh, colonial officer as director. So Keppel is still invested in funding cooperative studies in the social sciences, but while the poor white study in South Africa was authored by each researcher, they authored each one of their own separate volume with the joint findings bringing it together. Interesting, yeah, because you said Haley had a crisis, right? He, he just got overwhelmed. So yeah. this is really other people's work, except they got to put their names on this one. So in the first one, they do that, right? So they each take their turn. They don't know exactly what Keppel means by cooperative social sciences, but they see the dollar amount behind it. They're like, oh, whatever it is, we'll, we'll do it. We can do it, right. <laughs> yeah. wow. And then um, in um, Chatham House, the new advisors in London, they say, yes, let's do this cooperative social science study, but instead of having a horizontal structure where each one gets credit, let's have one person in charge who has public policy experience, public policy experience being governing, dominating over colonized people in the British empire, ha synthesize this material and, and produce the final report. And he does, like he has a, a nervous breakdown. But that is the research model um, that Keppel starts translating for US context. So you're gonna have a, an invisible team of researchers and someone with public policy experience who could translate that knowledge into uh, public policy recommendations, like a vision forward. And also the intent of the project. So an African survey's intent, while the problem in South Africa was quote unquote white poverty, the problem that the Chatham House advisors perceived was that all these different imperial powers in Africa were addressing issues on the continent differently. And if you were not in sync as white people, you would yeah. lose control. That was a vision. So let's bring us all together, white people, and get control over this continent or what happened in, or is happening in India will happen here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so ha having a cross imperial exchange of knowledge in order to help solidify white domination on the continent. Similarly in the U.S. context, so you have this research structure I already mentioned that was a, an echo and the purpose was to help policymakers across the country learn from each other's policies and then um, can become much more in sync. That's slightly different than saying that you necessarily want the federal government to be passing federal laws to bring everyone in sync. There is a space there to think that the states themselves, like separate imperial powers in Africa, could learn from each other and become more in sync and still leave public policies at the state and local level. Mm -hmm. And yet, during the process of writing this project, we're talking about the New Deal, mm -hmm. Keppel and Myrtle um, mm -hmm. start thinking that, you know, the federal government could play a bigger role in helping to, um, to standardize um, policies. Now, that's interesting because it, you, you make me think about the fact, and I'm thinking even now about the, the, the legal fight. Uh, who was it? The Marigold Report when the NAACP, when the Legal Defense Fund began in the 30s to look at attack and segregation. And that, too, was funded. I forget the name of the, 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 the corporation, but Charles Hamilton Houston, those guys, as Ralph Bunch writes at some point, I think it's Journal of Education, says, you know, the Negro is a special ward of the Supreme Court. So the black scholars are already thinking national trying to subvert this apartheid in the United States. But you're saying that these these foundations and these white scholars had to construct some kind of national uh, consensus or build some momentum because that's not how this was playing out in the US as distinct from what was going on in it. Uh, that's right. Nobody asked for this study in the US. So while- Nobody asked, okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Nobody asked for it. And that was Keppel's anxiety. Um, so uh, people asked for it in South Africa, right? South African advisors. In Chatham House in London, they asked for it. When he's thinking of transferring this project to the US, nobody's asked for it. And he knows that any national study would be um, controversial in the US. Um, okay. 
So he very much does not have a hosting institution like he did for the two prior studies. He becomes the overseer of the study. He, he rents offices from Myrdal down the street. He gets uh, feedback updates from Myrdal uh, very routinely, uh, several times a month, um, and then becomes much more hands-on during the writing stage, giving feedback on what um, would be uh, productive. For example, he was very anxious that Myrdal was not taking too seriously or as seriously as he wanted the white Southern perspective, because for Keppel, white Southerners were crucial if you wanted to have a national approach. And that was like the national approach to black Americans. So, so a white Southern is like the Afrikaners of the United States or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you, your connections, my good. So, 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 okay. So how does Murdoch, because he's coming, the Murdoch's are coming obviously mm-hmm. from out of the country. How do they recruit these black scholars who end up working with them? Cause they don't get credit. Right. <laughs> I mean, how does that, Murdahl approaches them? Is, is he given a list? How's he, uh, for, for, for people to understand how this happened, because a lot of American Dilemma, that scholarship isn't Murdahl's original scholarship, right? I mean, the way you talk about it. Yeah, so the SSRC helps. Um, Keppel was long inspired by the SSRC, even from the start when he did, um, he helped finance a project in South Africa. And that's another so, one of those foundations, the SSRC? Social Science Research Council is a, is a recipient of funding. Oh, I see, and they're still around. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they helped the, this vision of collaborative research projects, bringing researchers across the disciplines and the social sciences together outside of, you know, from different universities. And Keppel really does not have a hosting institution. So he's reaching out to the SSRC for help in bringing this together, um, something that he's doing very much in house. Uh, and this is Donald Young specifically at the SSRC, the sociologist who helps recruit um, scholars. So Ralph Bunch is coming back, for example, um, from a research sabbatical financed by the SSRC and uh, Young is like, oh, you need to come and, and do this project. This shows you, if you see the dynamics between the SSRC, Carney Corporation um, and black scholars, um, power, right? Power is central yes. here because- Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you have one, one string is the power of Carney Corporation to solicit the help of SSRC. Mm-hmm. SSRC is a recipient of funding mm-hmm. of you know the Carnegie and Rockefeller groups. So. How much wiggle room do you have to say no? Right. right. Keppel asked Young to write a, a report saying if you had a European, you know, statesman in charge of this project, how would you see it going about? And Young writes a report, a, like a memo, and Keppel uses it for um, to co- to convince his board. Uh, but Young never explicitly said this is what we would want. But the power of the organization to get this information from from someone like Young with the promise of, you know, the amorphous promise of funding. And similarly, they were able, Miro was able to recruit unpublished works by black scholars simply with the Carnegie name behind him. My God. We are, we're certainly going to have to have you back, but we want to turn now with our remaining time because, you know, those of you who know An American Dilemma and know the name Gerner Murdoch, you know the impact that this continues to have and how we think about race in this country. Um, you know, interestingly enough, Maribel, your own work as a scholar, as an academic, you know, what did researching and writing this book and doing this work do to you in terms of your own uh, view of scholarship and your own decisions in terms of your own career and work mm-hmm. and what you're doing now at, at the Institute? Right. So it's changed my life. One is um, I'll start with what inspired me. Mm-hmm. But inspired me were scholars such as W. Du Bois and Carter Woodson. And um, also the very lack of someone in the art. Those are the ones who had some proximity to these funders. They could write personally to Keppel and others. Nobody who looked like me, right? Or as a Latina woman, like a, anywhere in this network, whether close that or far. That is remarkable. That is remarkable. I mean, the only, the only Latina I can think of, Latino, certainly not a woman, was Schomburg. And Schomburg didn't have access mm-hmm. to his, even though he rolled with Du Bois and Woodson them, American Negro Academy, which you write about. But there's, there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. That interesting, huh? And so seeing echoes between what I was writing and um, what I was living as an academic. Yeah. Um, and then also from another lens, so as a Latina, but also, you know, as a white Latina, thinking, what role am I playing in this? Am I, am I echoing the uh, domination in you know, the production of knowledge on race in the US? Am I echoing exactly what I'm writing critically about? 
from the early 20th century. And what am I going to do about that? So I had received an Andrew Carnegie fellowship to do two years of research, <laughs> thinking, what role am I playing in the academy? And can I do this with a straight face? Um, and so thinking about that, and then also seeing the difficulty in publishing this book, I was being asked repeatedly through the peer review process to uh, change the narrative. Um, so really? That's was, that gatekeeping process I've seen you talk about over and over again. Yeah, so the real soft spots here that get some readers, uh, specifically white liberal readers, I would say really um, uh, it's sensitive for them, is a connection between a colonial African administration and um, post-World War II visions of racial equality in the U.S. I see. Is That's that what led you ultimately to decide to, to start the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences? Is that part of what, and, and what yeah. do you all do? Because in the we need to do some, I mean, not all of us can do the same thing in the academy. We're all playing roles within and outside the system, okay. and we need each other. The vision is to create a space. We are creating a space for critical engagement with the research questions that are being asked, the problems that are being perceived, how data is being collected, and also to see each other and to meet each other across the global South and North, because we are incentivized so much to just write in dialogue with a few scholars in elite institutions in the US. Mm. And we know from, for example, recently the Harvard letter, what dominating role some of these scholars play in the academy to the point where people might feel silenced um, from saying anything, whether it's about their personal lives or you know how they're being treated to their scholarship, to the research questions they're asking, uh, to how they're being published, whether they're getting tenure, so what is knowledge for and for whom? Mm -hmm. And it can't just be for the elite to better dominate all of us across the world. No question. Well, I mean, that, that's certainly um, the reason we wanted to invite you here and to this audience, which continues to expand. Um, I understand what you said about, you know, being a, a white Latina at the same time. We know that race is a fluid in remember because I would never even have thought that. <laughs> so I know it's different, different places in the hemisphere in the world. But as you're building uh, the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences and those you want to know more, go to Miami Social Sciences dot org dot org, please. Um, this notion of getting beyond these 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 straight jackets, these boundaries. Uh, and, and what you've given us in terms of a record of how uh, extreme wealth has been used to preserve inequality and maybe even some roadmaps to how we can either reverse engineer it or jailbreak it all together. I mean, we're really grateful. And I, ho I hope you'll come back because uh, we have everything else to talk about. So I would love to. It'd be an honor. Thank you. This is our time, our moment to move forward beyond the gun violence, the hospital closures, the unaffordable housing, Brian Kemp's Georgia for the wealthiest few. Stacey Abrams is looking out for every Georgian. She'll invest our $6 billion surplus in the fundamentals, education, healthcare, housing, and a good living. Putting more money in your pocket to build one Georgia where everyone has the freedom to thrive. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe. We all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. We've got to stand up. Republicans are banning abortion rights, tearing down democracy, blocking progress. But when Democrats stand together, we win. Because we voted, Democrats stood up for black lives, voting to ban police chokeholds, stood up for black women, putting one on the Supreme Court, stood up for our families, lowering cost of health care and prescriptions and capping insulin, and stood up for millions by slashing student debt. This November, let's stand up together and keep making progress. Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, Greg Carr, Maribel Mobley, Maury rather, and we're talking about white philanthropy. And we're talking now uh, about the first third of the 20th century with uh, Meadowvale. Professor Maury, pick up where you left off. So Carnegie has begun, uh, I think he he actually generated a report in the 20s, right? I mean, he, he, he has a text that his name is attached to, but we're going to see uh, the blueprint in part for, um, for the, an American dilemma uh, be generated there in the 1920s. Could you talk a little bit about it, this other, this other cat that emerges, um, Malcolm mm -hmm. And I know there's everybody else to talk about, so take it however way you want to. 
Okay, so Andrew Carnegie passes away. James Bertram is his personal secretary with lifetime appointments on the board. Uh, and there are two other personal secretaries um, who have lifetime appointment on the board, um, who all pass away around the same time in the 30s. Okay, so here we have Frederick P. Keppel as president of Carney Corporation in the 1920s. When he comes on board, a lot of the funding for projects in the U.S. have already been committed by the prior president. You know, before leaving, he's like, bum, 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 bum. here, here are grants. <laughs> Good luck, next president. You have nothing to be, a, you can't do much here. Yeah. And so he, uh, Keppel started finding some interest in this smaller, they call it the special funds for projects in Canada and the British colonies. And that's when he's getting advice from one of these personal secretaries on what Carnegie had meant by British colony. And again, he meant, according to the secretary, um, communities of whites. So assuming that he, that Keppel is in an organization that is not only geographically uh, limited um, psychologically to spaces where white Anglo-Americans dominate, but also an organization that is privileging the interests of those individuals, of those white Anglo-Americans. So um, that's when he starts thinking, okay, well, I'm within this framework. What can I do? What do I want to do? And he, uh, one of the first steps is to do an exploratory trip through um, British Africa to the spaces that Bertram said were okay to fund. And the first study that he finances is in South Africa um, in dialogue with local advisors, again, white um, local advisors, uh, Afrikaners and British settlers who found problematic the issue of quote unquote white poverty. Now, why was it a social problem for them? It was a social problem because uh, poverty amongst white people would challenge from their perspective white superiority and black subordination mm -hmm. because the idea was that um, white people had to be politically and economically uh, dominating dominating in the area for there to be peace and for folk who might not know when we think about south africa and say white that label doesn't tell you everything you need to know you just mentioned two distinct groups the british and the Afrikaners. could you say a little bit more about that because is poverty situated among the whites in one as opposed to the other or is it across right. the board right and that's a really important point um because whiteness is being created here mm. so within these communities uh the british settlers would not view Afrikaners as equally white um, okay. so how to create a common racialized identity that could be used to weaponize um, uh, themselves, right? Um, so that was part of the project to bring British settlers and Afrikaners in a common white identity. So in the book, in the, in the Poor White Study, the researchers explain that anything that you associate with Afrikaners of inferiority, like lower IQs or you know poverty, that's all environmentally created. But they could, and they were capable of achieving the same white European standards, quote unquote, as British settlers. <laughs> this sounds strangely familiar <laughs> to the yeah. United States. Oh, they're going to load this off on Afrikaners. Okay, so go ahead. So now the study, they, they did an undertaking. Thank you. Yeah, Keppel was very proud of this study. Huh. Um, so because if you think about it, and you can almost see echoes today, it's saying, okay, we are funding a project that's going to inform public policy. It achieves this impact. And the goal is ultimately to maintain international peace and order. But what is, why? Was there a threat to international peace and order? Because if, um, you know, South Africans, black South Africans actually achieved more political and economic strength, it was assumed by this community of white people, of, you know, increasingly uniting white people identities, that they would react violently. Mm -hmm. They themselves would react violently to that um, increased political and economic power amongst the black but diaspora. Was so, there any black pushback? Were they, was any South... South African pushback, any black pushback to uh, this work? Because as you said, they didn't consult any black folk. Um, and one of the things that you also bring out in terms of the investment of and the support of government in this is very important because then when you get to the American dilemma, you talk about how they had to cultivate kind of cooperation with the with the U.S. government and other mm -hmm. powers. Uh, but did any anybody black uh, push back against this as these reports are being generated? Honestly, that's something for other researchers to amplify. What I saw was Du Bois uh, requesting the study. He knew about it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Du Bois was very on top of Carnegie funding in Africa in the 1920s and 30s. He's like, can you send me a copy? I just, I just want to read it. You know? <laughs> well, that's interesting because you, 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 you pursue that line too, and I think that very much has to do even informing your your work right now and coalition building and kind of transnational coalitions. You know, you talk about Du Bois and the Pan African Congress. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're certainly in between World War One and World War Two. Uh, you have the anti-colonial movements, but Du Bois isn't just concerned about the affairs of Black folk in the United States. Well, I guess neither is Booker T. Washington. I mean, could you say, could you talk about how perhaps Black internationalism mm -hmm. which isn't really fully developed at this point, but how they might look at that as a threat to to their plans? No, they knew. I mean, um, mm. so W. B. Du Bois. Um, knows that Carnegie Corporation is privileging the interests of white people across the Atlantic to the point where he tests the boundaries. He's like, I'm going to make them say it to me. <laughs> so he says, I know your fellowship program. He's talking to another colleague in letters and says, I know your this fellowship program is only bringing back and forth white scholars. The Carnegie Corporation has, has like a fellows program between South Africa and the U.S. So he writes to Keppel. Um, and says, I would like to go. I want to go to South Africa. <laughs> and Keppel doesn't know how to tell him no, because a lot of these actors in philanthropy very much admire his brilliance. Interesting. But also are scared of him, of his intelligence and his ability to you know, bring people together. So he, uh, Keppel ultimately says, I have relied on my advisors in South Africa, note white advisors, and they think it would be um, an issue, a problem, problematic for you to go. So I can't. Um, so, and so that's one where they see the power of these organizations in creating opportunities um, for scholars and, and leaving out others. And um, also the amount of money, the wealth. Um, so when we're talking about big stakes, when Du Bois is thinking about an encyclopedia Africana mm -hmm. in the 1930s, and he's willing to compromise. He's compromising on working alongside the Phelps Stokes Fund, the same organization that has Thomas Jesse Jones. Yes. And could you say something? I mean, because it's interesting because we are talking about the Depression mm -hmm. and and you write about how Rosenwald, for example, loses his And as somebody whose mama went to a Rosenwald school, we know the impact of Rosenwald in tandem with Booker T. Washington building those schools in the South. But Rosenwald's money's gone. I mean, could you talk about how these 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 foundations are actually working with each other? And that encyclopedia, mm -hmm. the Negro uh, example, and I think it's chapter seven. You really do a deeper dive into those politics. You say something about how they really are working with each other. These these companies and or these corporations, these yeah. these philanthropic organizations. Yeah. So Thomas Jesse Jones started out working for the federal government, and I'll say who he is. He's he becomes this white expert, quote unquote, and a lot of what I say is in quotation marks, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the white expert on black education, that's who he becomes for this network of individuals um, in philanthropy. Okay, so in the 1910s, he mm -hmm. writes this book. Uh, yeah? No, no, no. I'm just thinking about that. That too has a contemporary, these white experts on black education that have a lot of money from foundations. Anyway, please continue. I'm not going to name any names. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, but that's part of my, um, if you're going to, like, just as a side note, that's part of my early midlife crisis in writing this. Oh, we're going to look, look, hey, y'all, <laughs> we, when we get this, look, we, we this is a build up to the work that's going on now. So pay yeah. very close attention because I think, uh, uh, Professor Moore is going to recruit us into some work before this is all over. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Please continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So Thomas Jesse Jones publishes this uh, report. He works in the federal government at the time. The Phelps Stokes Fund, backing up, had asked the Booker T. Washington what kind of study would be useful right now. And he, Booker T. Washington, said a survey of black schools. And he recommends Robert Park to write the survey. He's aware that these uh, funders want a white guy. Um, so he recommends park. But they instead choose Jones, who's working in the federal government, because they're thinking this would be really helpful to have the stamp of the federal government on this study. And it could be really circulated very well. Well, that works out in many ways, but in other ways not, because um, you have people in Congress who say, what is this money doing in the federal government? Not a lot of people know about the Phelps Stokes Fund, but they know, to your point, it's all part of a close knit network where a lot of these individuals are overlapping board memberships. Hmm. In New York, these are all organizations, Phelps Stokes Fund, 
Carnegie Corporation, Rockefeller organizations, which included General Education Board, Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial, the Rockefeller Foundation, and they're all intertwined. Um, Laura Spellman and Rockefeller is in Spellman College? Spellman University? Yeah. Wow. Okay, y'all. Y'all know these HBCUs be named for a lot of these people. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you go to Tuskegee and you see all the different um, buildings, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, so, so they recruit Jones from the feds but, and then, and then they're questioning, but you see the overlap. So they, they kind of, they're saying, and they're saying, I know the face of it is Phelps Stokes, but right behind it is Carnegie and Rockefeller. And I do not trust these, uh, profit maximizing, um, individuals in, in, in industry. Yes. So what are they doing educating our children? So Jones pops out from the federal government and becomes the specialist of education for the Phelps Stokes fund. He comes under, under the umbrella and he starts guiding all these organizations and how they should fund black education after the passing of Booker T. Washington, Andrew Carnegie, this first layer of people, he's advising the, for the, the next layer of, of staff members um, and saying, this is a right policy, the one that Carnegie and Washington really subscribe to. Um, so that's the first study you see in the 1910s with um, Jones. And then he ultimately produces two more studies of black education in colonial Africa. Uh, recruited by the same network. Wow. So, and, and, and so it, it's fascinating because, of course, we think about Woodson, whose money from these uh, foundations dries up right around the time he publishes Miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons he refuses mm -hmm. to connect with the HBCUs, and that's where they're putting their money. And they say, well, we, we'll keep funding the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History if you'll just affiliate with an HBCU. And Woodson not only refuses and loses his money from that, but that Encyclopedia of the Negro, as you write, about what he and Du Bois, neither of whom, I guess, as you write, were, were not invited to the initial uh, mm -hmm. meeting to plan an encyclopedia of Negro, but, but you write about the fact that what they have in mind, even mm -hmm. with their differences with each other, is very different mm -hmm. than what these funders have in mind. I mean, what it, it, it's an encyclopedia of the Negro, right? That would help all of us. But mm -hmm. what do they have in mind that's different than Du Bois and Woodson and the Black Scholars? What Washington, well, not Washington, Booker T. Washington in some way, but no, but what W.B. Du Bois and Carter Woodson were invested in is precisely what these white funders were scared of. Wow. Okay, so. Which is what? They were invested in a rising black identity, um, connections, connections between the U.S. across the Atlantic and um, pride um, and pushing back against white, white supremacy and black subordination, right? Through the use of knowledge, like what is, and it brings it down to that question, like you're asking, and we're all invested in what is knowledge for and for whom? And for them, the Encyclopedia Project was about bringing to light all these different levels of achievements. And again, that definition of achievement, um, we could break it down, right? Like, what does it mean? Are we playing into this white definition of achievement or is it a different one? Nevertheless, it was about amplifying and bringing together a Pan-African um, identity and community. Wow. What inspired Carney Corporation to start funding in British Africa was a colleague who brought to their attention the problem for them of rising black consciousness. Because, and this, and this colleague, J.H. Oldham from London, mm -hmm. who was visiting Keppel said, you should feel really invested in this and, and to other colleagues in, in New York City, including the Rockefeller organizations, you all should be invested in this. I know I'm talking about British Africa and I'm coming from London and you might feel like the problems over there don't apply to you. But if there's a rising black consciousness in Africa that will challenge our uh, British territories, it will affect you because there's a lot of communication across the Atlantic and you're going to have a problem here, quote unquote, the black problem wow. is going to be aggravated. So you should put money into this and stop it in its um, genesis. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. We've got to stand up. Republicans are banning abortion rights, tearing down democracy, blocking progress. But when Democrats stand together, we win. Because we voted, Democrats stood up for black lives, voting to ban police chokeholds, stood up for black women, putting one on the Supreme Court, stood up for our families, lowering cost of health care and prescriptions and capping insulin, and stood up for millions by slashing student debt. This November, let's stand up together and keep making progress. 
This is our time, our moment to move forward beyond the gun violence, the hospital closures, the unaffordable housing. Brian Kemp's Georgia for the wealthiest few. Stacey Abrams is looking out for every Georgian. She'll invest our $6 billion surplus in the fundamentals, education, healthcare, housing, and a good living. Putting more money in your pocket to build one Georgia where everyone has the freedom to thrive. Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, we've had a provocative uh, conversation, one that uh, has been extremely informative with Professor Metabel Mori. And once again, we've come to the moment when we clear the table and reset it for next time. We'll close today with uh, the words of Ayikwe Arma, uh, the Ghanaian writer, um, translator, social change agent, living currently in Senegal, and his 2006 book, The Eloquence of the Scribes, when thinking about intellectual work. And we do this with what we've heard and learned from Professor Mori today in mind. Ayikwe Arma says that his work as an intellectual is dedicated to changing the world that we live in, to standing against depression, to standing against inequality. And he says on the last page of chapter 25 of his book, The Eloquence of the Scribes, that day, that transforming day, will not come in my lifetime. There is nothing sad in knowing that. What matters is that I am doing what I can to bring it closer. And sometimes I meet pe people on the same search. So that's what we're doing at the Black Table. We're meeting people on the same search. We met one today. We'll meet one every week, one or more. And so make sure you tune in next time.